trying to kill someone. <laughs> okay, so I'm James Mickey. I'm a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Radio Astronomy in Germany. And uh, I work on pulsar timing for the EPTA. Um, this is my first time in India. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come to and talk at another IPTA student week. Um, I'm going to go through a few of the things that we have to consider when we're doing radio observations of pulsars. Um, as we saw in the previous lecture, you can observe pulsars at um, any part of the spectrum you choose. But in general, we take radio observations, um, and especially for pulsar timing arrays, which this workshop is uh, focused around. So, I mean, I'll give you just, um, I'll give you a brief overview of the, um, of the signal path that the, um, that the telescopes use, um, why we observe at radio frequencies, some kind of environmental effects that were touched on in the first lecture, and um, uh, how we consider these in our observations, and just some observing strategies that we might uh, that we might employ depending on the kind of science that we want to do. Um, sorry, just still just getting used to using this uh, this pointer. Okay, so we're just going to dive straight in and get some of the um, technical stuff out of the way. So uh, this is the signal path of the telescope or the the block diagram of what uh, the signal has to travel through. So we have the antenna at the at the top that's like the um, uh, that focuses the signal into the uh, into the feed horn and the amplifier. And the feed usually has two receptors to sample the um, uh, different modes of polarization. Uh, we saw earlier that pulsars are highly polarized radio sources, so this is something that we need to account for um, in our observing setup. It also allows us to um, uh, to sample more information for the pulsar, which is uh, important, as you'll see later. Because the radio signal is very weak, even when it's, um, even when it's being gathered by this big dish, um, we employ a, a, a low-noise amplifier with a specific frequency response, which allows us to select a frequency range that we wish to use for our observation. Just frequency RF, we call it. We, um, we employ a bandpass filter to remove RFI and harmonics of RFI. We'll see later that this isn't perfect, but we can build some, uh, some robustness to environmental effects straight into the telescope, so um, we can actually dis uh, discern the signal from, uh, from artificial sources of radio waves. We then convert to a lower frequency by a mixer, because um, low frequency signals are easier to transmit. And we do this by beating it with a monochromatic signal uh, from the local oscillator. So we down convert to an intermediate frequency for this part of the transition. And we send that off to our data acquisition devices. Um, so like filter banks, correlators, this kind of thing, or possibly to baseband. This is typically where we kind of stop these days. Um, which I'll go into in the next couple of slides. But in the old days, we might just um, uh, low pass filter it and square the signal, and send it to a pen chart recorder. Uh, this is how the original pulsar observations were done, where you just have like sheets of paper with a little pen chart just ticking off the signal as it comes in. But we kind of end at this, uh, at this one of these points down here uh, with baseband data. So baseband data is just um, raw, the raw complex voltage that we have detected at the telescope. Um, this is kind of the ideal thing that we want to save and work with. The trouble is that um, for a 10 second sub integration of, um, uh, of a sub band of your total bandwidth, this can number in the hundreds of gigabytes. It's an enormous, um, it's an enormous amount of data. So, um, it isn't really practical to save this long term. We have to pass it through some pipeline once it's landed on our machines, uh, just to reduce the volume of data that we have to store. So we typically de-disperse and fold with DSPSR, which you'll learn more about later, which allows us to reduce it to um, uh, archives that we can use with our software tools. And this typically numbers in the uh, sort of megabytes, tens or hundreds of megabytes range. Uh, as, 
after we've uh, after we've done this initial conversion, we can combine the archives from all of our subbands, all of our sub integrations into a single giant archive, um, which can be uh, have RFI masks applied to it and can be copied somewhere for storage. Um, long term, this is safe to take, um, just to prevent against uh, disk failure or to transport it around the world for collaborations or something. And it kind of looks like this. Um, I hope you can. I hope you can see the um, the labels on these uh, on these axes. We can. Oh, sorry about that. I can just explain then. So on on both sides, uh, the x-axis is the pulse phase. So it's um, um, it's kind of a it's kind of a three D plot uh, with the color bar. So you have the pulse phase on uh, this axis. On the y-axis on the left hand side, you have frequency, and on this side, the y-axis is uh, observing time. Um, the, the color scale just represents the, um, the strength of the signal. So you can see this nice, bright pulsar signal in the middle. Um, the stuff to the side is just the choice of pulsar that I made. kind of has a strange profile and uh, has some emission down here as well. It's not due to the scattering or anything like that. It's just intrinsic. So um, in, the case of the, in the case of this diagram where you have the pulse phase and the observation time, uh, just each pixel along here is a 10 second sub integration just kind of stacked up so you can see this kind of signal. Uh, these sort of nulls um, on both diagrams, this is the RFI masking that we've done. So um, some frequency channels have been removed because uh, they're contaminated with RFI and some sub integrations have also been removed. Um, this will just be like short bursts of RFI that we can localize to particular moments within the observation. And you'll come to see um, a lot of these over the next week. Um, you'll see some of these in the workshops, for example, when you learn to use some of the PS Archive tools. And um, I imagine there'll be a lot of talks next week where data are um, expressed in this kind of form. So going back to actually observing pulsars, um, they're very weak radio sources. Um, we normally can't see uh, individual pulses against the background noise. Uh, so to be able to see them, we need big telescopes, we need to observe with large bandwidths, and we need to take long integration times uh, to gather up enough signal to actually discern the pulsar from the background noise. And we can kind of quantify this with the radiometer equation. Um, so these are basically all of the factors that you want to either increase or, or um, reduce to just build up as much uh, flux, uh, flux density as you possibly can. Uh, so the important things are the signal to noise of the pulsar itself, um, the system temperature of your instruments, the gain of the telescope, uh, the number of polarizations that you're observing, so hopefully two, hopefully both, um, the observation time that you're taking, uh, the bandwidth, and then this term here is the um, is the duty cycle of the pulsar. It's just um, square root of the um, the pulse width divided by the, um, the pulse period minus the width. So this is just kind of a ratio of the amount of time that the pulse is actually on compared to one itself. And we can tie this. We can actually just tie this straight into the TOA precision that we are able to uh, achieve for a given observation, where we just kind of recast the uh, radiometer equation down here. Uh, this time I've used um, this delta symbol to just um, represent this uh, duty cycle term right here. So we get some, so if we look at some typical kind of values that we could plug into this equation, and you can probably just do this yourself later to get an idea of um, the mean flux density or the typical kind of TOA error. Uh, we might have a system temperature of 20 Kelvin. Uh, we try to push this as low as we possibly can by uh, cryogenically cooling the receivers uh, using liquid nitrogen. So if you ever get up to a radio telescope, you'll kind of hear some sort of like, oscillating pumping sound. Um, that's usually uh, the cryogenics that you're hearing. Uh, we record both polarizations. We observe for uh, typically an hour, 45 minutes, an hour or something like that when we're doing pulsar timing array observations. This could be this could be longer, depending on uh, if the source is extremely bright. It could be shorter if it only appears in the sky for a certain amount of time, and we just want to catch it as it's uh, sort of grazing 
our sky. Um, bandwidth that we kind of use at Ethelsberg is about 500 megahertz. This is actually quite small by, uh, by today's standards. Um, a lot of places use wideband receivers, um, like a gigahertz of continuous bandwidth or something. Um, the mean pulsar flux density, um, this can change a lot depending on the source that you're observing, so I've just used some kind of 0.1 Jansky to make things kind of easy to compute. Pulse period can also change dramatically. Um, I've just chosen five to make it easy once again. And then I've just redefined the duty cycle here so you can take a look later. So getting back to the choice of frequency, um, like why do we actually use radio wavelengths? So there are a couple of reasons. And the first is the flux density of pulsars. So pulsars are steep spectrum emitters, which means that um, they usually follow some kind of uh, power law, something kind of resembling a power law, or maybe a broken power law, where, um, where the flux density rapidly drops off uh, as you go to higher and higher frequencies. So um, on each of these, we just have a log, we have like a log log plot of uh, frequency versus flux density. So you can see that um, going, from, uh, going from 100 megahertz in this pulsar to um, 3 gigahertz, uh, there's a, a factor of a thousand drop off in flux density, so it's extremely dramatic. Um, there, also, a lot of pulsars just don't observe at higher frequencies. So we saw some examples in the previous talk of like the crab pulsar that can be seen basically all across the uh, all across the spectrum. And we'll kind of learn um, certainly in the science week um, why it can be very interesting to to use high energy. To, um, to study certain pulsars. But for now, we'll just stick to radio, and specifically why we, why we observe at about 1400 megahertz. So it might seem kind of strange that we observe at 1400 megahertz. You might think, well, why don't we just like go as low as we possibly can? It's like way brighter um, at low frequencies. But the problem is we run into interstellar medium effects that scale um, with frequency. So the uh, the, the lower the frequency, the more pronounced the interstellar medium effect. And there are two dominant ones that really um, impact us when we're observing pulsars. Uh, the first is dispersion, which is, um, which is something like this only in radio frequencies, basically, where the, um, uh, the low frequencies get delayed relative to the high frequencies. And if you don't correct, you get this kind of characteristic sweep. Uh, the, Intrinsic pulsar looks like this, but if we were to try to to integrate um, all of this without the dispersing, we just wouldn't see anything. It's just wrapped around far too many times. It would be completely washed out. So this scales as uh, frequency squared, um, which means that it rapidly gets um, gets to be uh, to be a big problem down to low frequencies. But we can actually remove this very easily. You'll see, you'll see more about this later in the week. It can be removed precisely and mathematically from our observations. Uh, something that's a little bit more difficult to remove, however, is scattering, which scales uh, even more dramatically with frequency. So, um, so what I'm showing here is um, just how scattering affects the pulse shape as you go to lower and lower frequencies. So we start off at 230. Uh, we can see pulse profile that has this, you can still kind of discern this um, kind of exponential scattering tail on the uh, on the trailing edge. But as you go to lower and lower frequencies, it gets broader and broader and broader. And eventually by the time you get down to 128 megahertz, it's completely washed out. So this arises from the, um, the multipath propagation um, uh, effect of scattering. Um, and at the moment, the, there aren't any really standard ways that we remove it from our observations. There are ways that we can attempt to mitigate it, but none are as, uh, none are as ubiquitous as the ways that we remove dispersion. Um, so this becomes very important. This basically means that we have a trade-off between, um, uh, between flux density that we get when we observe, uh, when we observe a certain frequency and the interstellar medium effect that we get at that same frequency. So it turns out that 1400 megahertz, 1500 megahertz is, uh, is quite a sweet spot. Um, also, you get a lot of receivers that tune to 
that kind of frequency, so it just makes a lot of sense to use uh, 1400. Um, we can also we also um, we also observe at multi frequencies just to keep a, a handle on some of these uh, interstellar effects. But for the precision timing, if you have a choice of just one frequency, you're almost always going to choose L band. So some other things we have to look out for uh, RFI con uh, contamination. Um, we have big parts of the spectrum, or relatively big parts of the spectrum, that are protected for astronomical use. That's reducing over time as more parts of the spectrum get sold off uh, for uh, telecommunications, for example. But even so, um, these, uh, these emissions can produce harmonics uh, that can find their way into our telescopes. Uh, they can also be, uh, RFI contamination can also be caused unintentionally. Uh, for example, um, car spark plugs can affect you at certain frequencies, mobile phones, obviously. Um, any kind of motors, really. So you can even have self um, self generated stuff at the telescope from the um, uh, from the motors that steer your telescope. So just to give you an idea, and this is probably going to be quite hard to see, but I mean, this plot goes from uh, kind of uh, tens of megahertz up to um, uh, up to hundreds of megahertz. No, sorry, up to thousands of megahertz. And it's just the RFI environment around the Jodrell Bank Observatory uh, just outside Manchester in the UK. Um, so the, the big lines, oh, the big peaks here, represent lots of RFI. You have some kind of flat parts around here, which are the protected bands, but there are still some, some things going on in there. But basically, if you go down below 1400 megahertz, you start to run into, um, into a lot of RFI. And you have to either build your telescope somewhere um, away from civilization that causes all this, or you have to be very clever about how you're going to remove it from your data. And it kind of does something to this, but something like this to your data if you leave it uncorrected. Um, these kind of um, sweeping lines uh, just come from some, uh, some broadband RFI that's taking place in the observation. It's, um, you can still discern a pulse shape there, and if you integrate, you can, you can absolutely see the pulsar. But you have this like horrible oscillating baseline, and it really impacts the precision to which you can uh, you can do science. So on the right hand side, it's the same observation, but with some RFI masks employed. Um, you can see there's still something going on there. It's not being removed perfectly, but uh, but it's much better. Uh, the signal to noise has increased from nine to twenty four in this case. So we saw about pulsars being um, very highly polarized sources in the last lecture. Um, particularly circ circularly polarized sources are quite rare in astronomy, so pulsars are quite special in that regard. Um, so this is something that we consider when we're taking observations as well. Um, we have the two, we have the two uh, feeds that sample polarizations and we kind of need these to be calibrated in such a way that we can believe the, the true polarization coming out of the telescope. Um, but just to make sure, we typically observe uh, noise diodes uh, right before we observe a pulsar. So, uh, so we can refer back to that, know exactly the properties of the, um, or the polarization properties of our receiver and just kind of calibrate based on that. So as well as, um, so also, polarization is something that gets um, uh, that gets uh, studied quite a lot, as you'll see in the Science Week. Um, but beyond that, um, errors in your polarization calibration can actually distort the um, uh, the pulse shape that you're that you're receiving, which goes on to impact your timing precision. Um, this is just basically because of how the uh, the total intensity is formed. Um, if you have some huge amount of power in uh, one polarization and try to um, form your Stokes eye, uh, it's going to cause a small but very noticeable um, deviation from the expected pulse shape and you can end up with some huge structures in your timing data that are, that are difficult to account for. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, certain observing strategies that we can employ. Um, so for pulsar timing arrays, we typically want to observe a pulsar every one or two weeks, or as, high, um, as often as possible, really. But it ends up being about once every one or two weeks. 
the reason for this is, uh, well, for one, it allows us to measure the timing properties of pulsars a lot more, uh, a lot more readily. But it also affects um, it also affects the frequency range of gravitational waves we can um, we can be sensitive to. So there are two important quantities: the, uh, the the total length of your observational data set and the cadence of the individual points. Um, and these set the limits on the upper and lower frequencies that you're sensitive to uh, in your pulsar timing arrays. So just as an example here, I've taken the uh, the timing data from uh, J1012 plus 5307 from BPTA, um, and it has a mean cadence of 4.2 days. So this is actually quite high. Um, another thing that we'd like to consider is binary coverage. So um, not necessarily for pulsar timing array science, but um, for things like uh, like the mass measurement stuff we, we saw earlier. Uh, it's very important to get good sampling of your, uh, of your binary pulsar. So um, what I've plot here is basically um, one orbital period of a binary pulsar with the timing residuals up here. Um, this pulsar is highly relativistic, and you can see a Shapiro delay signal in it, which you'll learn about this week. Um, and in this case, it's being decomposed into some harmonics. So as well as, uh, as, well as wanting to sample across the orbits quite a lot, uh, you also want to really make sure that each of these inflection points gets um, uh, get some dense coverage, just so you can uh, break degeneracies and really um, kind of approximate the shape in your timing solution. So kind of moving back to the nuts and bolts of how telescopes work, um, another, important, another important thing that we use is the observatory clock. So these are typically hydrogen mazes. Uh, they can be other things. They can be rubidium clocks. but. Basically, we want something very precise to timestamp our observations. Um, so we just have something like this that just runs at the observatory, records uh, a time offset once every sort of 10, 15 minutes usually, and it just kind of builds up a little plot like this. Um, don't be alarmed that this looks like really weird. Um, the, uh, the breaks are usually due to instrumental changes, so if you go and change a length of cable, I think the rule of thumb is that every 30 seconds of cable that you change, uh, you get an extra nanosecond of delay. That's just for the speed of light travel time. It's actually probably bigger than that. But these can also come from firmware changes or just anything um, between the receiver and the, and the data being dropped on the computers. So, uh, so these breaks have to be measured and properly accounted for in, uh, in clock files. But this quadratic kind of shape, and you also sort of see one up here, is just due to the um, the operation of the uh, of the maser itself. So these things use like a, a cavity oscillator um, that um, that they use to kind of define the length of one second. And environmental effects can, uh, or these are very sensitive to environmental effects like temperature and this kind of thing. So they have to be kind of steered every now and then which just means that uh, the size of the, the oscillator is changed slightly to, um, to kind of make this, uh, this quadratic turnover. Like you'll see this drift um, eventually decide that, um, uh, that you need to intervene and just slightly adjust your oscillator and, well, hopefully it'll level out, but it'll eventually start to come back down. So kind of the last thing I'm going to talk about very, very quickly, uh, interferometers, which is um, just a convenient way of observing. And many, um, many telescopes around the world and many that are being built at the moment uh, use this technique. It's where, it's where you basically take um, many small dishes and tie them together, um, either electronically or through some software, to create a single giant telescope. Uh, this is much easier to build than a single big dish. Um, and you also have the advantage of um, the angular resolution that you can observe um, actually increases um, based on the distance between individual elements. So in the case of the VLA these, uh, in this image here, these things are, um, are on tracks that sort of go in these three directions. And you can increase your resolution by uh, by just moving these things down the tracks, uh, all while keeping 
some huge collecting area. Something else that um, the interferometers are very useful for is um, their robustness against RFI. So if they're, if they're separated by a huge distance where a local source of RFI, someone on their mobile phone or something, affects one element but not the other, then these are no longer correlated and you can, uh, you can take some steps to just kind of remove this uncorrelated part out of your data. So you get quite a lot of interferometers. I mean, GMRT uses a, a kind of interferometry mode. We have LEAP, LOFAR, Westerbork in, uh, in Europe. We have the VLA in North America. And we have Meerkat and SKA in, oops. OK, we're back. Yeah, we have Meerkat and the SKA in South Africa and, well, Australia as well, eventually. So I'm just going to kind of leave it there with a family portrait of the, um, uh, the telescopes that are currently participating in the, pulsar, uh, the International Pulsar Timing Array. I've just covered some of the very basic ideas behind uh, the operation of radio telescopes here. Um, you'll get a much, a much greater feel for this as you work through some of the, um, the workshops this week. Um, and you'll also, get, uh, you'll also get more of a flavor for why we do this kind of thing as you um, as you approach the end of the week. Um, so I'm going to basically leave it there and just take some questions. And just feel free to approach me at any time during the week to, um, uh, to ask any more detailed questions you might have. I'm just happy to talk to you about this and show you some things. So, uh, so anyway, thank you. Okay, so this is this represents the incoming wave front. So um, if you have this like wave front that comes in at an angle, it's actually going to hit uh, this telescope before it hits <coughs> before it hits this telescope. So there's um, a very small but geometric uh, uh, measurable geometric delay between the um, between the two elements. So this can be measured either well, this can either be accounted for by kind of having a cable between the telescopes uh, with some known delay in it. Or you can take the data somewhere for offline processing and measure this delay to, um, uh, to kind of tie these two telescopes together. So it's just kind of, um, it's kind of representing the, uh, the incoming wave fronts of your observation. Yeah, on this slide it says RFI uh, is local to telescopes, not correlated across the interferometer. Can you go into more detail of what you mean by that? So um, I should probably have said RFI is not necessarily, or might be local, but um, so some interferometers can have baselines of hundreds or thousands of kilometers. So if you have like, um, if you have someone who's like using a mobile phone at one telescope, uh, it could produce an enormous amount of RFI in that one. Yet the other one could be completely unaffected. So the pulsar signal is going to be correlated among all of your telescopes because you're pointing at this particular source. But um, these local sources of interference are only going to affect one or a few telescopes. No more questions? Any other questions? So if you sample, so if you decompose it into its um, into its harmonics, you get a much better, you get a much, um, you break a lot of the degeneracies basically. Um, so it it just helps you with the measurements if you can decompose it into this and get measurements around each of the inflection so points. Like, so is this a Fourier series decomposition or? We can talk about this offline um, since this is like a pulsar timing thing, but. Um, this is just using the uh, like the H3 harmonic decomposition. It's like the uh, whatever you call it in tempo. It's like the DH model, I think, if you're interested. Any more questions? Okay, uh, 
Thank you. Thank you.